Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Smiling faces. I hope you're listening to us because now we talk about sustainability and we talk about the real future, okay? Um, sometimes we look a lot into the future without looking behind, but I think all of these men who are sitting on stage are good at looking at what is being done now and in the past and will make it better for the future. So you've al already heard their names, but they will also give a brief introduction about themselves. And we welcome questions afterwards. So if you have anything, please just put up your hand and we'll get someone with a microphone. My name is Anne-Marie. As you can see, I have a sustainability advisory here in the UAE. And we help companies understand that they can both save money, make their cultures better, and just overall make more profitable companies if they think about sustainability. So welcome. Uh, yeah, you can give a brief introduction. Yeah, thank you very much. Anne-Marie, hello, everybody. Well, my name is Cornelius. I'm in charge of uh, an organization which is called uh, DII Desert Energy, or known as Desert Tech. DII stands for Desert Tech Industrial Initiative. Uh, we started in 2009 to uh, enable renewable energy in the region, so North Africa and the Middle East. We, we started, obviously, at a point where people thought that renewables will never happen. There's oil and gas, it's too expensive. Uh, we believed in it. We published the first big uh, system study pointing in 2012, exactly 10 years ago, towards the possibility in creating an interconnected system between North Africa, Middle East, and Europe, um, entirely powered by renewable energy. And 10 years ago, we demonstrated with complex modeling, institutes like Fraunhofer, that this is convenient from an economical point of view. 10 years ago, it will create millions of jobs and it's much better for energy security and diversification. And uh, if you look now in less than 10 years, uh, the prices for solar and wind have come down 90% for solar, 60% for wind. We had one to two cents solar, one and a half, three cents wind. So this is a revolution because uh, this we didn't even predict for 2050. And this together with other things and we work as a think tank, but also create specific uh, leads, business opportunities for projects, uh, is really amazing. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wilhelm Hedberg. I'm the founder of eCar. We are the first and largest personal mobility company in the Middle East. You may have seen uh, some of our cars driving around Dubai. They're the blue cars that you can use the eCar app to unlock and pay per minute. And I, I feel like the reason why I'm here on stage is because every car that you're sharing uh, removes 17 owned cars off the road. So the idea is that a personally owned vehicle is typically parked for 95% of its life. And the idea with using car sharing is a sustainable approach to mobility and transportation, which we're bringing uh, not only across the Minats region, but also now we've launched into um, Southeast Asia with our launches in Thailand and Malaysia. So thank you very much for having me. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Crane, and I'm from Yellow Door Energy. Uh, we are a six-year-old uh, scale-up, I would ca categorize ourselves now, uh, de delivering clean energy solutions for businesses. Our vision is to reduce the cost, reduce the carbon foot, carbon footprint and increase the sustainability of the energy that businesses in this region, Middle East and Africa, are, are servicing. Um, we have uh, offices across five countries and uh, we count some of the major multinationals uh, and large regionals, the Nestle's, the Majdal Futames, uh, and many more as, as our customers. Thank you for the introduction, everybody. And uh, like you said it, really well that there's a lot of opportunities in what you're doing. You're both uh, like yeah. making sure that people can move around, you're giving them better energy, you're creating jobs, you're shifting everything that we are doing right now. But what are some of the major challenges that we're also seeing from transforming? We are in a region um, that loves transformation, but there are still challenges, right, to overcome? Of course, there's always challenges. So the biggest challenge uh, from when I started uh, 13 years ago working in energy transition in the region has been uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And uh, it is almost uh, 
you know, unbelievable that we are uh, in terms of phasing out where we are today, like here, almost no fossil fuel subsidies anymore in the UAE, Egypt on the uh, advanced phase, even Saudi, who would have thought that Saudi really increases the price of energy and we are halfway through and now with net zero, obviously that's the first things country need to do to completely phase out fossil fuel subsidies because they're the biggest barrier from an economic point of view. So phasing these out, that's the biggest challenge, and then anything will happen. Uh, and the energy transition very fast. Now, uh, econom from an economic point of view, technologies are there today. Uh, they're competitive without subsidies. So 10 years ago, that was a barrier. But today, I think uh, that moves very fast. And then, well, you can call it sometimes vested interests uh, in preventing uh, and that's a complex point, obviously, the change. But I think now I'm personally very optimistic because the last two years have seen, uh, you know, we started in hydrogen six years ago. Uh, we published our first big study in three, uh, three years ago and people laughed at us, what is hydrogen? But now how the discussion shifted in just two years um, in uh, incorporating hydrogen as an additional uh, part green molecules of energy strategies in how things moved now so fast, uh, net zero. Who would have thought that uh, UAE net zero and then Saudi followed, Bahrain followed. Uh, so this is all amazing developments, uh, COP27 this year, uh, next year, COP28 here. So I'm very optimistic that really many of these uh, challenges, they can be over overcome. And we see a big acceleration, indeed a disruptive decade, because we have tipping points of uh, technologies, market shares, prices, all converging. So this is a very powerful cocktail of things where really a big uh, pace of change cannot be stopped anymore. So both uh, Cornelius and Jeremy, you're most, mostly business to business, right? Whereas you, Willem, you're business to consumer. So you're actually working on changing people's behavior, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, in many ways, um, yeah, we, we, we look towards altering people's uh, purchasing behavior from uh, traditional buying a car into understanding that a car is a depreciating asset. It's, it's causing a lot of debt. Uh, we've learned, uh, for example, in Thailand, where we just uh, have launched, that um, a large majority of, of uh, internet generation have uh, massive amounts of credit card debt. And one of the largest components of that is the purchase of vehicles. You know, our, our view is simply, you know, not only necessarily to bring on sustainable approaches to mobility, but it's also cost-effective approaches for mobility for, for the masses, right? Um, take, for example, the case of, you know, the 10-odd million women in Saudi Arabia who over the course of the last two years were finally able to get their driver's licenses, right? And now, um, you know, rather than going out and buying cars, um, you know, women in Saudi with a driver's license can now uh, simply book and, and, and use an e-car, which is great. It's a, a sustainable approach to that without having to buy a bunch of metal that gets parked, um, you know, for 95% for of its uh, a given use case. So we're, we're doing our piece bit by bit, but in my view, just to address your point about the challenges, I think, in region, I think that, you know, I would argue that there's a great opportunity for the electrification of vehicles uh, in in um, in the Gulf region, there's small steps going in that direction. Um, we're proud to be the world's first Tesla car share program, but there's a ton of opportunity in that space. Up until uh, 10 years from now, when everything's autonomous, um, and and uh, we're basically just inside of a box c computer on wheels. So until then, a lot of uh, developments uh, to be to be seen. And what about you, Jeremy? You have now, for the past six years, seen solar really scaling, right? Are there some challenges that are really hard to overcome still? Um, look, I, I think um, I, I would fully agree with what Cornelia said a minute ago, that one of the biggest challenges for the energy transition, what we're investing in, is the subsidies of fuel, right? If the cost of fuel is subsidized, the motivation to change is lower. But I think the second one I'd, I'd add with that is, uh, is the regulatory framework that enables people to change. So when Yellow Door was founded in 2015, Diwa, our utility here in our, in our, in our home country of 
for, for Yellow Door had just created an exciting program to allow net metering. And we were working with Unilever and Nestle and, and so many businesses to put in green power solutions. And what happened three years later? They brought in a cap. They said, you can only install two megawatts maximum per site. So now, suddenly, overnight, those, we, we were, at the time we were working with uh, Landmark, right? A big, a big retailer here in, in the region. They had a built a brand new, highly automated warehouse. We were going to put eight megawatts on the rooftop. And then, over a two week period, this was introduced, and that eight megawatts dropped to two megawatts. So suddenly, three quarters of the CO2 abatement that we were planning on, on helping Landmark with was off the table. So regulations do play a big role. Um, now, we're fortunate that we're in an area that in some countries is uh, what, what I'd say is quasi-regulated, right? Many businesses are not connected to the grid, especially in places like Saudi, or they're connected to an unstable grid like in Pakistan or Nigeria. And so we might as well just operate off-grid. And that is one of the ways, when we talk about optimism, that I see going forward. I see us moving beyond the regulations, and, uh, and certainly in a pricing perspective, we've moved beyond where natural gas or oil can compete. So we can, I'm optimistic, that the rest of this decade is going to be very viable for that transition because we can operate outside of regulatory constraints and we can certainly be more cost competitive. I, I think it's very interesting, and, and the fuel subsidiary is a, is a big issue. I can hear, for instance, from a company I know very well, that they cannot afford solar because the generators they have sitting in the backside is more cost effective, right? So you're up against these subsidiaries. Um, very interesting. Um, do you believe, Cornelius, that companies understand where their emissions are made? and that they understand how much energy they spend? Uh, increasing, uh, increasing number of companies does, I would say. Uh, a few years ago, a super ESCO company has been created in the UAE, uh, Etihad ESCO in Saudi, Tashid. So uh, that's a very exciting market. It's, by the way, uh, with much higher margins, ESCO models, uh, than solar. Uh, it has different challenges, of course. But um, I think that kind of development brought an increasing awareness. Um, but uh, there's still a lot of room to do audits, uh, particularly in countries like uh, Saudi, to understand uh, where, how they spend uh, money for different forms of energy. So that's actually the lowest hanging fruit uh, of any. I always say before thinking about how to generate energy, it's uh, convenient and uh, you must reduce the waste. And uh, huge amounts are wasted and technology is there. The biggest um, um, lever is obviously efficient cooling. Uh, if you talk about energy efficiency, that's probably 80%. Uh, and technology evolves fast. So with efficient cooling systems, uh, and you don't need to invest anything. There are models, as I mentioned, ESCO, where the company doesn't put anything. You just commit for a long-term agreement, and you share the savings with the company that invests. So I think, uh, generally speaking, uh, that's probably a thing where more awareness needs to be created. We are on a good way, but it's uh, uh, an imperative in the energy transition because uh, huge amounts of energy that are still wasted, also because energy is too cheap. And I will go back to you again, Jeremy. Uh, from my side, I'm, I keep thinking, why are these big buildings here in the UAE and many other places still not built with, for instance, renewable solar panels on the side of them? Is it because the technology will be old too fast? Or is it just because it's too much to put on a building project from the beginning? Well, look, I think you're talking about building integrated photovoltaic. BIPV. Mm. BIPV is a, is a really, um, uh, has been around mm. for a long time, mm. right? I, I think about, I did my first solar project about 12 years ago, and it was around back then. The problem with BIPV is the economics. I can cover a rooftop of a warehouse, and I can wire that all up very economically. We can save people 50% on their cost of power. 
But when I try to wire up the side of a skyscraper, and I try to connect all that to a central node and inject that into the building, it's a lot more expensive. So it comes down to, I'd say, primarily the economics of it. And so while I'm a strong believer in distributed energy, and that's where our business is focused, for the dense parts of our, of our city, uh, downtown Dubai, uh, old Dubai, where our office is in JLT, those areas will continue to be powered by centralized generation. Now, a lot of that can be clean. We know that DWA is investing hundreds of millions of dollars in clean power, and that's great. Um, I think moving that to the side of skyscrapers is not something I see in the short term. Um, perhaps in the long term, we're seeing great innovation. I've been talking about tech innovation all day today here. I'm see we're seeing great innovation in printed PV, right? These flexible sheets that you can put it in. That's uh, a decade ago, the efficiency of that was 50% of what a normal panel is. Today, it's almost equivalent. The cost of making it is becoming much more compatible. So with both of those things, I think we do, we will see more BIPV. Might not be skyscrapers still, but it might be the metro stations or, or other uh, buildings that are more centrally located. So one of the things this one is also called is carbon emissions, right? And that's what we all talk about when we talk about mobility. Um, I think there's uh, somehow a distorted image of how much uh, emission comes from personal mobility and from transportation overall of goods and that sort of thing. Do you think we should educate drivers more, first about why and when they need to drive? And overall, if we can build cities that are smarter and if that's part of your strategy for the future? Yeah, I mean, so that's a great question. Yes, I, mean, yes, uh, <laughs> I think we can educate a lot of drivers on a lot of things. Um, right now at eCar, we're pulling in about 1.3 million data records every day. So I can tell you how a, you know, a, a 25 year old uh, German man drives in Dira on a Tuesday morning. I mean, I don't know if I need to know that, but we know that information, we have that data. The, the mapping of that data through our, you know, through our algorithms can very much help any city planning operate and optimize for how road conditions should be, should be handled and so on. And that kind of logic is now being used at future cities like Neom and the, in these kinds of, of areas. So sure, the, the data is there to help support these kinds of, 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 of functions. As far as driver behavior is concerned, uh, one of the interesting anecdotes about adding connectivity to cars is as soon as you turn on the ignition of the car, you can actually have your driver scoring uh, happen from the computer of the car itself. So there is a world in the not too distant, I mean, in a matter of months future, in which uh, an e-car member will get a driver's score, which actually could give rebates back for good driving behavior, uh, for not running red lights, for not speeding, not for these kinds of things get your insurance premiums uh, reduced, for example, save you real costs, which then uh, in return would also support the contention of having lower uh, emissions in, in theory as well. A fewer accidents, things of this nature. So it's very top of mind, it's very topical right now at eCar about how we then use this data to then optimize for these kinds of things. And, and does the data come back to the for instance, this German young man driving in the middle of Jira, and that he's, is he driving worse or like emissions better or worse than a similar driver? It does in the sense that um, we would then, our, our AI would make sure that there's a car that's gonna be parked within a 250 meter walking radius from that power user. So our, our AI would be able to trigger, let's say, CAFU to fuel our vehicles, which they do between two and six in the morning. Our, our computer systems tell their pilots to fuel the cars, have the cars shifted to hot zone areas uh, so they're convenient to walk to and, and to get to. For the, for the AI to then function on the next level, the next iteration of e-car which is coming out, sure, the driver scoring would then come out and then that individual would know like, hey, I'm driving super well, I can get credits back, let's say for e-car, I can, re again, reduce my insurance premiums. Uh, so on and so forth. We can partner with other companies on this kind of thing. Uh, so the the um, the you know we, we see this as an endless opportunity. 
So I have a question for both Cornelius and Jeremy. <clears throat> Capacity. Capacity. It seems like we are building bigger and bigger energy capacities around the world. And what happens is that people are using this capacity, so we keep building more capacity. Um, much of it is still being done in a fossil heavy way. How do we make sure that we don't allow both businesses and, and individuals to just endlessly use capacity? You're, you're nodding along. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. And, and I think that um, we've looked at a lot of studies about capacity addition, especially in the MENA region, right? Looking at what is going to be the demand over the next five years, kind of 2020 to 25 period. Um, there, is, there is a need for, there will be a need for 50 gigawatts of additional capacity simply for businesses, let alone uh, residential, other segments. And, and my belief is that that capacity is probably understated because it doesn't capture the demand for electrification of vehicles, other things that are happening. So, so yes, there's a huge growth in demand. Um, how do we make sure that that demand is serviced with clean versus traditional uh, carbon-based fuels. And also that people don't keep adding and adding and adding the need for, for more, right? <laughs> so so that's, that's a difficult one, right? <laughs> so, so saying that we, can, that we can meet the demand, the growing demand with clean energy is one thing. Mm. And I believe that, that we're there, clearly we're there, that when it's sunny, solar's the cheapest. So there's no question, everybody should be doing that. And people who didn't make that decision two years ago when they built a new plant are kicking themselves, right? And that there's no question that somebody's building a new plant tomorrow, whether they're in Abu Dhabi with a low cost of power or in Saudi with a low cost of power, they, will still, they should still be putting in solar. It's still cheaper. How do we prevent them from, or how do we put a cap on that demand? Well, we're in a part of the world where the population's growing. Right? We've got a 6% year-over-year population growth in Saudi. I don't know that it's viable to cap that demand. Right? And I, when I look at the Middle East and Africa, the reason I'm focused on this region is because there is a demand. I just want the demand in this area, in this region, these regions, to be serviced with a clean solution, a, a low cost, a clean and reliable solution, unlike what many of the developed, more developed parts of the world, Western Europe, North America, um, where they developed based on a uh, dirty carbon-based um, energy sources. And if we can transition to that, yes, it will create waste because you've got more solar panels, which will eventually drive e-waste, but at least the year-over-year -year production of CO2 will not increase from this new demand. Yeah, well, uh, if you look globally, the last few years in a row, renewable energy capacity has been more than 90% of all installed new capacity in the world. And this is mainly due to economic reasons, because as Jeremy said, solar and wind, not only here, even in a country like Germany, uh, you know, we are sub-4 cent solar. So even a country like Germany, which wants to do 80% renewables in 2030, in eight years from now, and Germany is already at 50%, and it's uh, the country with the largest industrial base with a big energy consumption. So it shows this is possible, and this will happen for economic reasons. So I think anybody thinking about adding uh, conventional capacity will uh, for sure have to look at the stranded asset risk. It's, it's a big risk. Um, we'll have uh, the fossil fuel volatility. You know, uh, the crisis of energy in Europe shows that volatility is a big risk. And this sheer volatility uh, obviously makes planning impossible. And it is actually a major factor for renewables as well and for green hydrogen that you have uh, one price for 20 years and you don't have this fluctuation of oil and gas prices because this volatility adds a lot of risk premium and makes planning, as I said, impossible. So I'm very confident now that, you know, the economic reasons, phase out of fuel subsidies and the other things together 
they will uh, probably prevent conventional capacities from uh, being significantly added in the region uh, over the next few years. So we also had a conference where there's a lot of investor interest. Um, uh, I read the other day an article that said that Goldman Sachs in America still has $22,000 billion okay, invested in oil and gas investments. And that they didn't foresee the green transition to be immediate. And for that reason, they would keep heightening that number. But how do you find it? Is it getting easier? Uh, both for little business investments, but also for larger investments to come to energy. I can maybe touch on that quick. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're currently in a, in a fundraise round at the moment, um, and ESG is coming up as a big component. Um, a lot of the international uh, investors especially are, have that as a requirement. So if there's some, some sort of environmental angle, if you're dealing with um, developing countries uh, facilitating with uh, improvements there, but definitely the environmental factor is becoming more and more uh, a, a, uh, a requirement nearly for a lot of the funds, at least that we're speaking to in our world. And, and are they informed then? Do they ask you tough questions? Sure, they do. Um, of course, uh, you know, what, what kind of uh, carbon emission savings are we doing in accordance to people driving regular vehicles or the, having owned cars and so on? Um, but it's, it's, it's scratching the surface. I mean, this is more or less maybe more of a, a tick box than it is uh, a super heavy DD on the sort of ISO 14001 component of our business, let's say. But um, yeah, it's definitely a, a factor. Well, if it's a big one or a small one, I'd argue that it's probably a smaller factor, but, but nonetheless, it's, it's there. So now we're getting to the end of the session soon. Um, it's a big topic, this one, both tackling infrastructure, energy, emissions of the future. Do you believe that your strategies that you're working with now will change the future of both Dubai and other places in the world? Jeremy? I do. I, 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 believe, that, <clears throat> I believe that everybody sitting here today is going to have a big impact on the future of Dubai and the whole region. And and I think that that's going to come through um, a change in the economy from one that is carbon-based to one that is uh, the future of, of, uh, of new businesses that are choosing Dubai as a hub because it's a fantastic place to, to live and to work and to build a business as opposed to it being that carbon hub. And I think that clean tech can drive that. Um, and I think that clean tech can also reduce the cost of energy, which can also attract businesses. So I think those two are going to, from my view, have a big impact on Dubai's future. And Cornelius, you have, the, you have the plan in your head for what the future is for energy? Yeah, well, I foresee personally a disruptive decades. It will be really exciting years ahead. And as Jamie says, we move to diversify the, company, the economy, many jobs. Actually, I want to see more startups. You know, with Dubai Angel Investors, we have done 33 investments, not a single uh, clean tech, which is really a pity. Uh, I've personally invested in a few startups here. Uh, I'd love to do more. So this is a huge opportunity, actually. But Dubai has already become a global center of the energy transition. And this makes me quite hopeful, this development, that it will continue in a very dynamic manner. Yeah, and sort of in our view, in the, in the late you know, 1900s, uh, everyone owned a horse. And uh, when, the, when the car came, that was kind of a hobby thing. Um, of course, now we're seeing uh, for the rich. And then now we're seeing, of course, that uh, you know, people uh, ride horses as, as rich people ride horses. And, 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 and the car's taken over. And then the next iteration of that, in our view, is that the autonomous vehicle will take over. And owning a vehicle will be like, kind of like owning a horse, right? It's going to be a hobby for the rich uh, as a side gig. So um, that, this is the transformation that we're seeing in our industry. We're already seeing in Yaz Island, they have you know, taxis, auto autonomous taxis already driving now, which is a way ahead of the curve. So the UAE is doing quite a bit in, in that regard to, to push the envelope. And we're really happy to be part of that ecosystem. Excellent. Anyone has any last questions or comments? Any, any comments or questions from the audience? Nah, it looks like. Um, but I think we've had a really good discussion today. I hope for all the startups that you do think in your energy and emissions 
uh, as you grow, because of course the bigger you become, the more it means. Um, and then come and talk to these guys. When you have questions, they will answer them. Thank you for today. Thank you.